Good afternoon, John Lamlash. This is Kathleen Dudley from New Mexico, and I'm looking forward to our conversation on the new age. Welcome, John. Thank you. Well, me as well. It's quite a subject to tackle. It's kind of like wrestling with an octopus, <laughs> uh, a greased octopus uh, in a big pot of spaghetti. But we'll see if we can sort it out. Um, I know you have some points uh, to make and some uh, names to name, and this is important. There are key names. Uh, I'd like to alert those who are listening to uh, the fact that we are going to be cautioning you about who comes to you as representatives of the new age and what kind of message they have really compared to the message that they appear to have and uh, so we would like to provide some critical scrutiny. We were just saying before the recording that uh, there is, to my knowledge, almost no critical scrutiny of what is happening within the New Age movement today. Correct? Yes. And it, uh, when it came to my attention what the New Age really was, it, it, it spun me around for a, a number of months as I, um, as I tore down uh, what was what, what I had taken in. So I'm very appreciative of this ability to have this conversation with you, John. Me as well. In fact, it gives me the occasion to uh, go back to 1991 when this book came out. Now I can assure you, the subtitle is The Complete Guide to Spiritual Pathfinding. So I can assure you that when I wrote The Seeker's Handbook, 1990 and 1991, I was living in Santa Fe. Hmm. It was the peak of the New Age movement. It was, it was like a, a you know, surf in, in Hawaii. And I was in a way in the curl at that moment although I'm not part of the new age, but it was all around me. In fact, Santa Fe was called at that time, the Mecca of the new age moment, a movement. And it had been made famous, of course, by Shirley MacLaine, who published this book in 1983, called Out on a Limb. I know that well. And uh, it's a fact that Shirley MacLaine who popularized mainstream the new age, being a, you know, a, a, an attractive, well-known movie star, had a guru and her name was Chris Griscom, G-R-I-S-C-O-M-B. And it so happens that when I arrived in Santa Fe, 12 years before Shirley MacLaine wrote Out on a Limb, which became a TV film, I met Chris Griscom and I knew her for many years. And I have to say she was charming and really liked me and I liked her. We used to run into each other on the street in Santa Fe and chat, but I was never involved in any of what she did. But due to the fact that she was known as the guru of Shirley MacLaine who mainstreamed the new age, she also became very famous. And she wrote a book called Ecstasy is a New Frequency. And she used to tour all over the world. But I knew her when she was reading palms in a small Hispanic village outside of, of Santa Fe. It's odd because this is typical of my experience in life. I've, I've touched just slightly on so many people and so many events that later on developed into something bigger, but I was never involved in that development. So anyway, what I would like to do in the first part of our talk is to give you the background. And the background is actually in the Seeker's Handbook. Uh, so one of my goals when I wrote it was to establish the foundations of the new age, the historical foundations. 
And there are several chapters uh, on that topic. So let's just look at that for a moment. Let me recap it briefly, if I can. That sounds great. It's sort of like if you and I imagine are standing around a, a, a stone uh, entrance, you know, a stone wall to a well. And we're looking down into that well. And we're asking a question. Hmm, I wonder when this well was dug. In other words, how far is it down to the bottom of the well? And when was the bottom of the well dug? And then subsequently the dug the well filled with water, right? So we put on our gear, we get a line, get our repelling gear, and we decide to descend into the well. <laughs> and it so happens that if you do that, you'll find that you come to two water lines. There's the bottom water line, the deepest, when the well was sunk. And then when you come up, there's another significant water line. Uh, and then you come up to the top and you come out of the well, which is the present. Uh, is that a clear analogy? I think it's a, a wonderful one. Thank you. Yes. So what I did in the Seeker's Handbook was I went to the bottom of the well. And I basically explained that the origins of the New Age movement in the West today go back to a specific moment in the Renaissance. Hmm. And that was the moment when some documents in Greek and Latin called the Hermetica came from Constantinople and they were sent by mule in a package on the body of a mule to a great Renaissance human, uh, humanist philosopher and prince, Cosimo de' Medici. Oh. And, and Cosimo de' Medici, as I explained, was at that time, uh, he was at the center of the Florentine Renaissance of art and intellectual culture. And so when the first seed of the New Age was dropped into the West, Note that it came from Constantinople, Istanbul, which is in the east to the west. It was dropped into the fertile culture of a, the Italian Renaissance. And Cosimo at that time was quite old and not well, but he saw the importance of these documents. So he gave specific instructions to his scholar and mentor, a man called Marsilio Ficino. And he said, Put aside all your other studies, put aside the Bible, everything else that you're looking at that we have received as a spiritual heritage and look at this and translate it. And that was an important event for Cosimo de' Medici, the great Renaissance prince at the end of his life. And in that way, the Hermetica came to the West. Wow. And that the Hermetica contains uh, I don't I don't have uh, the books here because I'm packing away my books in storage now. But if anyone wants to dig into the turf, the standard edition of the America published by Shambhala is in four volumes. They're all about 400 pages each and they contain the Greek and Latin interfacing. OK, and this America, when you boil it down, has primarily two fundamental ideas in it. And these are the fundamental ideas that are at the basis of all new age concepts, in my opinion. Okay, that's, that's what I argued in, in like the Seeker's Handbook, 1991, uh, when I was young and sprightly. Okay, <laughs> so what are the two ideas? They're very simple. One idea is that there is divinity in the human being. Mm. And there are many variations of that proposition. Either you are divine, you have the seed of divinity in you. I call it in not in his image, the God self equation. 
and I warn about this God self equation, but it's very popular. You know, God is yourself. Many of the Hindu and Indian uh, Mahatmas and masters who came over in the 60s, and that is a, uh, a current of the New Age movement, uh, proclaimed this idea. I call it the theogenic idea. Theo meaning God or divine, and genic meaning to generate or birth within. So some of those Indian masters, namely, for instance, Mahana Ramana Maharshi argued that the only purpose that you have in being here alive in this world is to realize that you are God. Okay? That's the theogenic idea. And that is incorporated in the Hermetica. And it is reflected in a lot of the teachings of these gurus. Maharishi, Mahesh, who, who are all of them that popped up in the 60s. So that's one idea. And you find that dramatized in Out on a Limb by Shirley MacLaine. There's this scene where she's on the beach with her guru. And he tells her to walk around on the beach and spread out her hands and look at the sky and say, I am God, I am God. So this is an essential proposition of the new age which is not Gnostic and which I entirely oppose and refute, okay? The second idea is co-creation. And this is a really important concept because it comes very close to the green agenda and the idea of working with nature and, oh, the earth is dying, Gaia is in danger and we must save the earth mother. Therefore, we must work in co-creation, co-evolution in order to serve the Earth Mother. So this is another notion that has come out of the New Age, which has been co-opted and perverted into the globalist agenda. So that's it, really. I mean, I summarize it in the Secrets Handbook. That was what, 30 years ago. I don't think I could say it any better today. Those are the two seed concepts. And, and John, th those certainly do come out very glaringly from what I observe as well. So I would say you were, you were tracking really well a long time ago. I was living in the Mecca of the new age in yeah. Santa Fe. Yeah. Like I said, I knew Shirley MacLaine's guru 12 years before she knew her. Yeah. I, when I left Santa Fe, uh, Donald Neil Walsh had moved into town. And he was one of what I would call, okay, I'm going to talk about the 90s generation, new age, and what's happened since then. So this guy, Neil Donald Walsh, blew into Santa Fe just as I was on the verge of leaving in 1991, and I never met the guy, but I went to his house once, strangely. Anyway, uh, suddenly here's this man writing this book called Conversations with God. Well, when I saw that title, I was pretty pissed. Uh, and I have to say that by 1991, when that book came out, I was fed up to my back teeth with all the rhetoric and propaganda and bullshit coming out of the new age. I knew so many people firsthand. I knew them personally and talk about, you know, walking the talk, right? There was so much talk about all these new age ideals and, and then when I looked at them as individuals and people, I wasn't convinced of their authenticity. And for me, authenticity has always been the bottom line of everything. Yeah. So uh, where was I? Yeah, 1991, The Secrets Handbook came out. And it's really at that moment that the whole New Age movement peaked. And then as we get into the later period of the 90s, 
You have people like Deepak, Deepak Chopra, uh, Eckhart Tolle, and you have actually these new age superstars <laughs> who are being <laughs> sold to the public, you see. Mm -hmm. So it's really significant, I think, that my book came out in uh, 91 because to me it was, it was really the turning point. And when it all started to be processed and programmed as uh, a mainstream mind control event, which it was already in many respects, as you well know. Well, I was wondering if you could step back a little bit and, and talk about um, uh, how that came about with the CIA and MK Ultra and the Frankfurt School and just give us a little bit of a, an understanding of why in the world would this happen? This was our spiritual evolving as individuals. And so what, what was behind all of this? Very good question. And it's not easy to see all, it's not easy to track all the developments. There are significant gaps I myself haven't been able to fill them in, but I'll give you the best bet sketch I can. Suppose that we go back to the well. So we've gone down to the bottom level. Now let's climb up the rope and let's come up to the next significant water line. And that's Blavatsky. <laughs> Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, also known as Madame Blavatsky, also known as HPB. Now, in 1875, considerably before the CIA, right? Madame Blavatsky, this eccentric Russian woman, broke onto the scene in the United States and she founded the Theosophical Society eventually. And she wrote these two monumental books, Isis Unveiled in two volumes and The Secret Doctrine. And when I was growing up and I was putting in my time as an apprentice to Western spirituality and occultism, you had to read these books. If you didn't read these books, you just weren't in the game and they are not easy to read. The amazing thing is that at that time in 1875, these books were enormously popular. They were equivalent to bestsellers of their time. So whatever the case, Madame Blavatsky is largely regarded and correctly as the figure, the godmother of the new age movement. And that is correct. But you have to tweak that statement a little bit. You have to just adjust it. It's not exactly Blavatsky herself that was the godmother of the movement. It's what was done with what Blavatsky did. So in order to understand that, you have to look at two other women, one of whom is Alice Bailey. Now I may be one of the few people in the world who has the complete works of Alice Bailey in hardcover. Wow. And I can tell you that they are about, that's a yard and a half on your bookshelf. Wow. So I have read it all. Treatise on white magic, treatise on cosmic fire, the externalization of the hierarchy. That's the key. The externalization of the hierarchy. That's a title of a book by Alice Bailey, who was second generation theosophist. And of course, so, that goes back to, you know, 2000 years. That goes back to the issue of a, an elite ultra righteous cabal. Yes. You say. So there is an elite ultra-righteous cabal operating on the planet. You can learn all about them from not in his image. But what's really interesting here is the moment of hybridization 
the moment when that Zadik program got grafted into Blavatsky, and then that led to the secret connections behind the New Age movement, and they come entirely out of the UN. Yes. So I remember but, but when John, I was reading, uh, yeah, go ahead, you have a comment? Yes, and, and John, the connection of the UN uh, is, is interesting as well, because it's the successor to the League of Nations post-World War II, which is 100% communism. So that, that element itself, I think, is pretty chilling to anyone who understands that connection. It is indeed. And not only that, but if you can track the kind of plot developing here and really get on board what happened, then it's great because you really have an insider's view on how the nefarious uh, globalist element in the new age came into play. It was, as I say, it was not with Blavatsky herself. It was with the second generation theosophists, Annie Besant and Alice Bailey. So Alice Bailey wrote this book called The Externalization of the Hierarchy. I bet very few people have ever heard of this book. It is so important because what she did in this book was she took a theme from Madame Blavatsky and she parlayed it into a political globalist ideology and in turn handed that over to the UN and they today are running with this ideology. Wow, that's pretty big. It's, it is really stunning when you see it. So how did she do that? Well, Blavatsky was a weird number, uh, a very eccentric woman. And there's, of course, a great debate about how much of what's in the secret doctrine, for instance, Blavatsky just invented as her fiction. It's what I would call a, myth of, a mythic fiction of a gifted schizophrenic writer like Philip K. Dick, and how much of it was actually, you know, based in any kind of fact. But the whole scenario, the whole key to the plot goes back to a three-letter agency. And this is quite amusing because we all know about three-letter agencies, right? CIA, DEA, FBI. But have you ever heard of the GWB? I don't think so. What is the GWB? The Great White Brotherhood. Okay, I have. That is the mother of all three letter agencies. And Blavatsky invented the Great White Brotherhood. Now, some people would say she didn't invent it, mm. but I say she did. Mm. So in the Secret Doctrine, she says there exists a secret hidden society, a cabal, oh. a behind the scenes group of advanced souls, the most advanced, consciously advanced and enlightened members of the human race, the Mahatmas. And they live in the remote regions of the Himalayas. Hmm. And they are called the Great White Brotherhood, right? Hmm. And this was her fiction. This was Blavatsky's big narrative, hmm. you know, and you can read all about it in the Secret Doctrine. Well, what happened was that when Bailey came along, Alice Bailey, she politicized this notion. And I don't know how and when the connection was made, but you've seen the clip that I sent you that, that gives the factual background. The factual background that everyone should know is that in the post Blavatsky era, all of the works that derived from theosophy were published by the Lucas Trust, 
L-U-C-I-S, yes. Lucis. And the Lucis Trust was located at the United Nations and still is. Yes. It was all so about the Lucis Trust, trust yeah. It's astounding, isn't it? So the Lucis Trust is the propaganda wing of what was made out of theosophy. Don't blame it on Madame B. She was just an eccentric and rather lovable and crazy Russian woman in her own right. But what was where it was taken was straight to the heart of the globalist program. Well, and and that's what's behind it today. And what was really interesting is that um, that in this Lucis Trust, we see names like Henry Kissinger and Rockefeller and Norman Cousins. I mean, people whose names well, we I would expect Rockefeller and Kissinger, but I was surprised by Norman Cousins. And there were a, there was a, a whole list of others, of course. Hey, all the usual culprits are intimately involved. So the takeaway of this story is that as the way it developed, that Blavatsky's theosophy, which also brought forth these concepts of the God self and co-creation, but in very elaborate esoteric uh, framework of rounds and races and ages and globes. I mean, theosophy is, in, is an incredibly complicated paradigm but essentially brought it forth. And at some point, and I don't exactly when or how that happened. I mean, what was the liaison between Alice A. Bailey and the UN? Who was the liaison agent? You say, I don't, I've never seen that reveal. But nevertheless, the facts show that that's what happened. And so the globalist ideology of the new age, which is dangerous, came about in that way. That being so, the people who are running the transhumanist agenda are going to look for every opportunity where genuine grassroots new age movements spring up to send their agents in and co-opt it and direct it toward a globalist, zero carbon, zero COVID program, you see? And the new age cannot escape that danger. It's inherent in the foundation of the new age. And can you explain what you mean that it's inherent? Are, are, you, are you saying because of the two basic premises of the new age uh, upon which it's, it's, um, it's based or? No, that's a very good question, by the way, and thank you for that. You're welcome. If you want to sort out those two key factors in the paradigm of the new age, uh, theogony or the God self equation and co-creation or the great work as the alchemist said it, the great work of human co-creation, how humanity co-evolves with the natural world and with the divine mother who is the source of that world. If you wanna sort those out, just come to Nemata, my school, and I'll be happy to sort them out with you. Those are philosophical metaphysical propositions that need to be argued and discussed you know, on their own terms. What we're talking about here is something that uh, is typical of how the archon parasites work in this world. They take any genuine phenomena like the youth and psychedelic revolution of my generation and they see it coming and they subvert it and pervert it before it comes. So this is what has been done with the new age and uh, Whatever anyone takes away from this conversation, I I do wish that you take away that warning to be very, very cautious because the Gaia factor, the Gaia hypothesis, return to nature, love, love your mother, 
co-create with nature is essential to the new age worldview, but it is always steered toward the globalist agenda. They want that. They want you to think that you have that co-creation with nature, but you can only have it on their terms. And there's a real battle line here being drawn because what does it mean to have it on their terms? It means exactly what the Great Reset says. You will own nothing and you will be happy. You will not travel 20 miles from your home because you, ex you expend too much carbon. You will not breathe the air freely or without fear because you are a, a walking by a weapon. This is, this is how evil it can be. Yeah. And the tendency to go in that evil direction is present in all new age developments. Mm -hmm. I hate to say that, but it's the bloody brutal truth. It is. John, I, I wonder if we could just drop a few um, names and, and scenarios and then maybe delve into the ones that you think are the most important in the time we have left. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, speak a few and then you can just cherry pick from that. Um, sure. So Barbara Max Hubbard, um, a Findhorn community, um, the, um, the Course of Miracles, um, and, uh, and um, maybe just leave it at that for the moment and see what you might want to pick up out of that. These are really high profile cases. And you really have to know who these people are and what their influence was. So take uh, David Spangler, who wrote in 1977, Revelation, the birth of a new age. You could say that that single book alone was like the flare that announced the new age, 77, 87, and then 91, about 14 years later, when I wrote The Secrets Handbook, the wave crested, but he was a seminal figure connected with Findhorn. And if you look now and carefully research, you will find that all that new age idealism and the uh, co-evolution with Gaia, which was represented by the, the miracles of Findhorn, and there were actually miracles that happened there. Inexplicable things happened there with nature. I've been there, I've seen it. If you push away all that idealism and all that hype, you'll find that David Spengler is a hardcore genocidal globalist. I don't know if he was at the beginning of the moment that he launched the, the movement, but he is now. And you can find quotes from him on the internet that are blood chilling. Same applies to Barbara Marx Hubbard. The middle name Marx being the trigger, okay? She is a child of Marx, okay? So she wrote in 92, one year after my book came out, The Evolutionary Journey. And in that book, she presents this idea that human evolution is a spiral and that we are aspiring to ever and ever higher consciousness. And who is it? It's at the peak of that spiral. Who is it that leads human consciousness into its uh, dimensions of higher evolution? Well, it is a certain cabal of a master race type of people. And Barbara Marx Hubbard, you know, Grandma Hubbard, when you see pictures of her, she appears as this white haired woman beaming at you. And she appears to be just everybody's friend, you know, when you look at our ideology, she actually says that we, meaning those who ride the tip of the spiral, are the white horse and we are here to call humanity. Wow. She actually says that. So she's a beautiful example of someone who might appear to be a benevolent and loving uh, 
a spokesperson for the new age, but then when you really blink your eyes and take another look, it's not that at all. Yeah. Uh, you also mentioned, I think, uh, well, there's a few Miracles. others. Course of Miracles, Byron Katie. Um, yeah, okay, Course of Miracles is a horrific propaganda that has as its basic uh, goal, the saying of Jesus from the New Testament, forgive thine enemies. So basically it is programming for anyone that uh, would be inclined to fight against the enemies of life and the psychopaths to say, no, 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 don't fight against them. Listen, would you like to have miracles in your life? Well, here's a book and here's an exercise for every day of the year. And if you do this exercise every day of the year, you will have miracles in your life based on one condition that you adhere to the absolute forgiveness of anyone who has ever harmed you or done wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how to comment any further how insidious this is. You see? That book was immensely popular in Santa Fe in 91. I was so sick of this stuff. I, I actually escaped Santa Fe. But then you have others too. More recent, you have Byron Katie, uh, who is the partner of Stephen Mitchell, uh, translator of romantic poetry of uh, Goethe and other things. You have Abraham Hicks. Yes. Channeling in the tradition of Jay-Z Knight, Ramtha, in the tradition of Seth. So there is a contingent of channelers in the new age. And that includes extraterrestrial channelers like yeah. uh, Barbara Marciniak channeling from the Pleiades, uh, a woman that I knew, Barbara Han Clow in Santa Fe, channeling from who knows where. Uh, all that channeling phenomenon to me is like sewage that just runs out of the human psyche yeah. and I don't I don't endorse or accept any of that channeling besides oh. it's dishonest it's faking you know why don't you just admit that it's you inventing all this that would be more honest I'd respect you more if you admitted that you are the author of this material rather than trying to claim some authority from an extraterrestrial source. It's pollution in the New Age movement. It, it brings right up to the current day of, of listening to Simon Parks, who claims the... Uh, yeah. And he has a long, a big following as well. A big following. Well, and, those and people who followed those characters like Simon Parks, my message to them from the heart is that you are pathetic losers who have completely abdicated the responsibility to take care of your own minds and develop critical scrutiny and learn for yourselves what is true, authentic, and valid, and what is not. Anyone who can accept the spoon feeding that comes from phonies and carpet baggers like Simon Parks deserve the shit that you get at the end of the day. That's my humble opinion. Well, that's a, that's a harsh awakening, but, but I think this is when we have to have the awakening, is it not? We have to be ruthless. If you want to talk about being wake up, being awoke, being woken up. Yeah. Well, how sharp are you? You know, how sharp is your intellect? Yeah. How rational can you be? Yeah. Uh, can you exercise the essential divine faculty that you've been given by your divine parents of property? You know, show me the evidence, prove it to me. I mean, we're at a point now with this vaccine apartheid 
where we're looking at an event, not in the future, right now, today, where there's a division of humanity. And that division I've spoken about already in other terms as the mutation of A11 from A10. So there's actually mutation happening in the human species. Yeah. And this mutation is a self-selection process. You can select yourself into the higher mutation, but you have to prove that you're worthy of being in it. You know, this is no joke. This is an end game we're looking at. And you have to prove that you can exercise your rational faculty and critical thinking and not follow some carpet bagging slogger yeah. like Simon Parks or who knows the others, or even Eckhart Tolle. Eckhart Tolle is another one who's come out in what I would call the post 90s generation of the new age. What are these people doing really? Are they teaching you anything? Or are they just telling you things that you like to hear? So we're, we're critical and, and we're going critical with the mutation of our species. I mean, how can I put it more ruthlessly? Well, and where you stand on the new age is, is a good measure of how you play into that mutation. I, I, I think so, because, you know, to be duped is 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 to be pulled along in into this transhumanism and if we don't use our logic and our intuitive knowing uh and and understand what our authentic self is and what authenticity is out there then we're pulled along and we have a, a in my in my view of my life and others we have a reason to be here and it's not to be pulled along by some cabal No, you're really focusing so well on what, on my thoughts about the takeaway of this talk, you know, because whenever I start over my mouth, which I do very often, uh, I always like to think about what's the last word I'm going to say, I'm going to leave people with. It's something that matters. And that's actionable, you know? And you're exactly right. The way that the current crime against humanity is shaping up is horrifying and frightening. But on the other hand, what is the great opportunity here? There's a great opportunity in it. And taking off from what you just said, Kathleen, I would say the opportunity is to see and know who is directing this game? Who is directing the world drama? Is it some evil cabal, and that certainly exists, or is it the precious quantum of humans who take responsibility for directing it, you see? And if, if you wanna be in that cabal or that elite, in the Gnostic elite, then there is a lot of responsibility involved, but we can be those who opt for that responsibility, I should say, they can be the directing force of the society to come. And they can be the people who call the shots in the beauty to come. I totally believe that. And I am totally at the core of that development. Mm -hmm. But you have to know that those, that evil cabal of the globalists, the transhumanists, uh, really are pushing everything they can and they will use anything. They will use your best ideals, your best emotions. They will use your love and your compassion against you to reach their goal. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Bless you. Excuse me. You know, it's, 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 it's hard for, 
for many people, certainly for myself, and it's a question that keeps happening, is how in the world can, can, can that, can that um, behavior be perpetrated and why? I mean, against, against life and love and nature and, 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 and relationship and everything beautiful and, and, and worthy of our, you know, of our passion and our, and our energy and our creativity. And, and I keep just coming up with the fact that it's, be, I don't understand it because I'm not of that. I'm not of that, that lack or that, that, that uh, deviation. And um, so perhaps not fully understanding it um, speaks worlds. <laughs> no one who is not a psychopath can possibly penetrate yeah. the mentality of a psychopath. You can't. So if you know that you're a psychopath and check your pulse there, folks, uh, <laughs> then you must admit that you're never going to be able to really, it's inconceivable how they operate. And these globalist transhumanists, going back to the Zadik cult that I expose in Not In His Image, always go back to the root of evil. Uh, they are not just psychopaths, they are our psychopaths. One of the great lessons of that cult the Gnostic message is that the evil that's working in our midst here on earth has a non-human factor in it. That's why you can't ever get it. Don't ever try, don't ever expect yourself to try to really wrap your mind around it mm -hmm. because it has an archontic non-human factor in it. Mm -hmm. However, that's both, that's also the good news, because it means when you know that, then you can say, uh, compensate for that factor being in there, and then learn how to go up against it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But again, the Gnostic message that I uh, try to get out to the world says that you cannot go up against that archontic factor without being intimately bonded with the Aeonic Mother, your Divine Mother. It's not a battle that we can fight on our own. So the living Gnosis today has one objective and one purpose for everyone, to bring you into the sacred bond with the living intelligence of the earth then you don't live your life on your own anymore. You realize it's not even your own life. It, it's your life in her life. And when you connect with that source, there is the unique answer to finding the power to face this archontic problem, which translates archon equal transhumanism. Mm -hmm. You see? And of course, if we're on the right track here and we're making it all clear to people, Kathleen, then they will understand, be wary of anything in the new age that goes in the direction of transhumanism. Yeah. So. And, and, and what it means, John, is it means that we have to truly, as you pointed out, understand authenticity. And we have to, we have to, um, understand um, from an intuitive perspective and how do we develop that strong intuitive guidance, that strong intuitive uh, knowing. And I, I just share a, a very short story, but I was adopted by a dog um, last September and I have never really been, you know, I've been a cat family up until then, but that experience of when she birthed eight pups um, put me in a position where I, every single moment for the next nine months, had to operate completely on my intuitive knowing to make the correct decisions for their life. And I took that responsibility very deeply. And what 
that whole process of these canines brought me was an, the most intricately connected experience that I could possibly have during these times because that was nature in her most beautiful blossoming. She gave me the responsibility of life outside of my own to make the, the proper intuitive decisions to ensure that they had the very best care and ultimately the best new homes when they left me. But each moment when I had to make those decisions, I had to hover like on the pin of a needle to make certain that I was making the, the most authentic and most intuitively careful decision. And that was through a gift from nature. Yeah, I can see that story really well. And to me, it illustrates uh, a couple of really important truths about getting through this current uh, event, which is really hyping up, as you know, and escalating very fast. But to make one last referral to the new age, which is relevant to what you say about animals, I would say this, uh, in the new edition of, not in his image, which is coming out in September, I added and embellished this uh, theme of the relation of human animals, as I call them, to non-human animals. So as human beings, if you want to call yourself that, you have a relation not only to nature, but also to other animals, our four-legged friends and our the reptiles and the insects and the birds and everything. And what I've emphasizing in the uh, in the revised edition is is what is called the symbiont. Symbiont means the agency of living together. So in order to have the strength to get through this into a world uh, that's sane and pleasurable, we have to make sure that our bonding to nature and other animals is very, very strong. And that will guide us and, and secure us to the future. That's what you're finding. I find that also in my relation to all animals, not just uh, the domestic ones that we may live with, but the ones in the fields, the subsistence animals. This is really, really important. As you grow stronger in the connection to the Divine Mother, you grow stronger in your empathy to non-human animals. And that's a big factor in getting us through. But to make a last, to take a last shot at the New Age, one of the characteristics of the New Age, which you will see, not only in the superstars like Eckhart Tolle and Byron Katie and Jay-Z Knight, people like that, but you will also see it in the followers of the new age is their deep-seated narcissism and, and the obsession with their self, with the self. And that factor of narcissism is the new age rhetoric feeds that. Uh, yeah. But what you just described is the absolute antidote to narcissism, you see? The more you move toward your empathy with nature, plants, and animals, the more it heals you of this narcissism. The, uh, most of the new age phenomenon is simply about narcissism. Wow. Toxic narcissism. Oh. So that little anecdote you, you, you raise is, is so relevant uh, to how to avoid the perils of of the new age, which are many. Yeah, well, well, I, I, I knew it was a gift in spite of how incredibly um, taxing. Demanding, it is demanding. You know, even to have a dog or a cat, it's incredible responsibility. I mean, look at how it uh, influences your ability to travel. 
they traveled with me. I had nine dogs in my car. Where if they I can travel with you, but in some cases that's that's not possible. Well, I so when what they were, are you going to do? When they were little pups, yeah. But yes, yeah. I, I, I did not leave them. But but yes, it, it's a tremendous responsibility. I know you you know that with your responsibility with your animals. This is correct. Yeah. So listen, we're down to like the last five minutes because we agreed we'd do about an hour and 15 minutes. So I'd like to hear any concluding remarks you have to make and then I'll top it off with the cherry on the cake. Okay. Well, I, I, guess, um, I guess the thing that, that comes to me from all of this is that, is that um, what I found when, when I realized that the New Age movement was, um, was a mind control, uh, uh, mind controlled and, and co-opted. And once I got through the outrage of that, because to me, my spiritual evolving and connection to, to, the, to, to the divine elements of life, uh, um, that, that it is all real what what we experience and we just have to break through to understand what is authentic and i i think you said it the best i really don't have anything more to say other than than um thank you but you you conclude <laughs> well i can take it back to the hermetica so in the Seeker's Handbook, I presented a synopsis of what is the content of the Hermetica. And as I said, I explained how those two ideas are the seed concepts of the New Age paradigm, for better or worse. But there is a word, there is a phrase in the uh, one of the most famous, probably the most well-known uh, document in the Hermetica is called the uh, for Mandres. And I've written about it and talked about it on Nemeta. So if you join as a visitor, you can find this material. And in the For Mandres, which means the shepherd guardian or overseer, it's kind of like a visionary event. There's an individual and he reports that he was out in nature somewhere and, and a great being came to him, a great force, a great presence, and spoke to him and said, I am poor Mandres, like the shepherd of man, they usually say, the shepherd of humanity. And so a dialogue ensues. And uh, in that dialogue, uh, this Latin, it's in Latin, and this, these two words come up. Actually, they're, they're Greek, mixture of Greek and Latin. And the words are, when, when the individual says, well, who are you? What are you? How can I identify you? And the voice says that I am authentias nous. I am the mind of authenticity. Mm. I am the authentic mind. Mm. You see? And this is tremendously powerful meme. So what is the authentic mind? Well, it's your mind already. That's what it innately essentially is. But maybe you don't know that yet. Maybe you don't know how to take advantage of the fact that it is so. So even though your own mind is the authentias noose, you need to cultivate it, but you cannot cultivate it on your own. So you cultivate it in connection with the planetary mind, and then you are on. Then you are on to the big game. And that will give you everything that was promised in these paradigms of the Hermetica. It doesn't give a God self identity, but it gives a goddess self bond. It, and it, it leads you into all, everything that's necessary to co-evolve and co-create and create a better society in the future. So 
the answer is there. I'm very happy that I can speak about the new age in this way. Obviously, it pleases me a lot because it, it just as we're speaking, Kathleen, I recognize that that book that I wrote 30 years ago was authentic. Authentic <laughs> and right on time. <laughs> right on That's, time. Right. Still right. today. Yes. Yeah. Well, yes. And uh, and it was um, it was giving the opening and the understanding of of of, of this whole process. So yes. And I, I, a dear friend of mine um, back in the seventies was, um, was interviewed by the uh, Sa uh, San Francisco Chronicle about the new age. And his quote in his response was any age, but the new age. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's, right. That's good. Well, on that note, I think we can leave it for now. And who knows where we'll go next, but we'll certainly continue our conversations uh, sometime in the future. Not in this image is being published on the 18th of September. Congratulations. Thank you. That's fantastic. Well, John, so until the next time, my friend. Thank you, John. It's been a real pleasure. See you around the bend. Okay.